I want to say this openly and straight. I have a daughter, she's 30 years old. She's got a job which does not provide health care. So she signs up for the uh, affordable, quote unquote, Affordable Health Care Act. And it costs her $5,000 before she can get any recompense for any treatment. $5,000 discount, right? Then she has to pay 20, 30, 40, 50 dollars copays. Do you know what the Affordable Health Care Act is, in my opinion? The Affordable Health Care Act is a subsidy for the large insurance companies. Now, yes. anybody who, who disputes that hasn't figured it out. The administration and the Democratic leadership of both the House and the Senate in 2010 decided that they, they, they were going to take a half a loaf and, and support something that everybody can, can make money on except the poor people. Yeah. Look, the difficulty that we have, and, and Aaron put his foot finger on it, is that we still believe in market capitalism. And that doesn't work. It doesn't work. I think it works by the one major area, tomatoes. I really think it works in tomato. I'm against centralization of ownership and control of tomato farms, of truck farms. I really am. But it doesn't work. And what's happened is that they've lost, they've lost a million people registered for the uh, Health Care Act because people are beginning to figure it out. I mean, if the Democratic Party is going to is going to really be faithful, I'm going to say one more thing after this. If the Democratic Party is going to really be faithful to its, its, its uh, beliefs, it has to enact single payer. Yeah. It has to do that. <laughs> we, we, are, we are, I'm sorry, we are a backward country on health care. We're a backward country on housing. We're a backward country on education. We used to have the best higher education system in the, in the world. The higher, I am an expert on higher education. I'll, I'll, I'll admit that. Our higher education is best described as higher training. The other thing is we have a great training robbery in this country. Billions of dollars come from the federal government to train people to do nothing. You know, people don't need training. They need education. And they don't need education for the jobs that don't exist. There are no jobs. I mean, that is foolish. What people need education for is to be actually the kind of citizens that we need. We need, edu we need critical education. We need the kind of education that gives people the sense of their own power, as Margaret was speaking about it. And you know what? After they have after they have decent education, they're going to be poor. It's, they'll still be poor. But with a decent education, they'll know what to do about it. Look, you, there are no jobs for college graduates. And they're still peddling the horseshit that college education is necessary to, to get decent income. That was true 40 years ago. It's no longer true. And I have documented that. It's not something that is a, a mystery. College people are working at McDonald's. College people are working at Wendy's. College people are working part-time. They're working at Walmart for 28 hours because Walmart give them, won't give them 30 hours because the 30 hours they've got to get health care. They've got to pay a little bit of health care. Now, the third thing I want to say which is kind of, you know, it, 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 it's hard. My mother died at the age of 97. She never made real any money. But she had a union. And she lived in a union-sponsored co-op housing development, which is on 23rd Street, 23rd Street, 30th Street, on 9th Avenue in, the, in New York. And she paid a lot of money for her rent. It wasn't rent, it was she owned the apartment. She paid $510 a month for, uh, for an apartment whose market value was $5,000 a month in the neighborhood. That's because there was a, a union-sponsored housing. We have unions 
By the way, 800 unions have supported uh, uh, um, single payer, including the AFL-CIO. And you know what? The, the people in Washington pay no attention to it. Of course, they, you know, they didn't take over the streets of Washington. I'm sorry, I have to say that again and again. If they had taken over the streets, it would have changed the situation. It really would have. But on the question of housing, the unions have billions of dollars in their pension funds. And I'm ashamed to say that most of them have not spent 10 cents on the housing for their membership. And in New York City, and I'm sure it's true of San Francisco, I'm sure it's true of San Diego, I'm sure it's true of, of Los Angeles to a large extent, the housing inflation, which is basically a form of fictitious capital, it is not a form of genuine value, it's all paper, it's like we used to play the game Monopoly, you know? The housing inflation is driving poor people out of the cities, out of the good cities. And, and, and we have unions who are looking and letting the real estate people take over. This is no good. The problems are very deep. And you know what the union people tell me when I make this speech? And I do, by the way, speak to a lot of union people, a lot. They say, Stanley, if we did what you said to do about housing, we wouldn't be able to give our members a high enough pension, which raises my final point. Social Security, which under the legislation of 1935 was supposed to pay people 50 to 60 percent of their of their of their wages while they're working, have fallen behind. I am a Social Security recipient, and you are too. My Social Security pays 25 percent. Of course, I'm, well, you know, but my my Social Security pays 25 percent of my income. 25%. People can't live on that. Most people, I can now, but no, most people can. So we have a social security situation where people say, we have to privatize social security. Oh my God. By the way, watch Obama. Please. I know I'm not supposed to attack Obama because he's a, he's a, you know, he's somebody who now is calling for, for doing, doing things on, on climate change. They're going to start experimenting with privatization of Social Security. You heard it on November the 15th, 2014. And I think it's a very serious problem and we're gonna to have to figure out how do we deal with Obama and not give a, a great um, uh, um, uh, uh, ammunition for the right. I, we have that problem. But, but I think Margaret's right. I think what you have to do is you have to find a way to criticize and criticize constructively. And the first thing you would do on Social Security, don't touch it. The second thing you have to do is make it 50% again. So that people can live on Social Security rather than having to scrape all the time. By the way, Social Security has become a poor people's uh, 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 pension. If you don't have a union, if you don't have a corporation, by the way, the corporation, it's now down to 25% uh, to of corporations give any kind of pension, supplemental pension. It's ridiculous. So what we're building is, a, is poverty for the next uh, for the next generation. And one of the things about that poverty, beyond all of the hype that you hear, is it's going to be deeply an interracial poverty, a multi-ethnic poverty, a college-educated poverty. And we have to start thinking about that, and not talking about education in the abstract, and not talking about training. And, thing, and foolish things like that. Of course, certain training on the job are very important if you get hired, but you don't need training as an, as an excuse for education. So, where would you like to the next? Sure. Um, so, I think it's a, when thinking about, you know, the role that the Democratic Party plays, we, and then, you know, I, I think this has uh, been a really good uh, uh, panel and discussion, and I think people here at least uh, have their eyes open uh, to the role that the Democratic Party plays, and, you know, I think it's great that you're trying to reform it uh, from within, but, you know, it's never about inside or out or, or outside, it's both. We, we need both. We need the movements in the street along with people working uh, on the inside, but, you know, we have to be clear that 
Uh, when, it, when it comes to the Democrats, there is uh, so much overlap with the Republican Party that it's actually difficult to find significant distinction. I mean, the, the, both parties, what their role is to manage the system of international capitalism. There's bipartisan agreement on international relations, on the war on terror, on surveillance and spying, on the energy policy, on trade pack, packs. Remember, you know, what, what, what is Obama? Uh, come out and said that you know uh, that maybe now we could get the Trans-Pacific Partnership passed. That thing would be an absolute disaster, both economically and, and politically. It's NAFTA on steroids. Um, you know, he also there's also floated the idea of maybe the the Keystone XL pipeline. But certainly, I think that whether now it looks like he may be leaning against it, but I don't think that's really that relevant anyway because it's become kind of a sideshow to the fact that how much Obama has expanded oil and gas drilling, you know, allowed it in the Arctic, which is which is horrifying to, to think that this is how we're dealing with climate change by allowing drilling in the Arctic as it's, it starts to melt. And most important, there's broad agreement on monetary and fiscal policy. And the, and the thing is, you know, I, I never trusted Obama because as, as a working journalist, I, I followed his uh, comments and positions closely. Um, and, and, you know, I just want to leave you with, with one point in terms of, like, how rigged the, the game is, or actually two different little points of information. So, you know, if we go back to September of 2008, uh, near, a little over six years ago, the global markets were absolutely melting down. There, there was this crisis of, you know, even I think Newsweek had a cover as like, is this the end of capitalism? I, the, the, everything was seemingly coming apart. This was when Lehman Brothers uh, uh, went under, when the, the TARP bailout passed. And remember, that, that passed with majority support of the Progressive uh, Caucus in the House of Representatives. It was the uh, House Republicans who actually killed the first version of the TARP. But then they came back and, and passed it a, a couple of days later. So in the, while all this is going on, Larry Summers, you know, the guys at the World Bank, uh, uh, Clinton's architect of deregulation and liberalization, writes an op-ed piece in the Financial Times in late September of 2008. He lays out exactly what Obama has wound up doing in terms of his economic policy. It was to a T. He's like, you know, we're going to have a, sh a short uh, focused stimulus. And this is very important to remember. The stimulus was designed to fail. It, it was enough to prevent the economy from crashing. But it was very simple math. I wrote about it, other, and plenty of economists wrote about it at the time. Because at the end of 2008 into 2009, the US uh, uh, economy was shrinking by 7%. Now, to keep even with essentially population and inflation, you need a 2% GDP. So just to keep even, we would have had to have a 9% economic stimulus. Okay, that would have been on the scale of $1.5 trillion a year. Right? So if they were serious about reviving the economy, it would have been a three to four trillion dollar stimulus. And they knew that. That's why uh, Summers was writing that we're going to have a very focused stimulus. He said no new entitlements. This explains the, the health care. And you can look, look at the charts. The government, um, the health care spending on as percent of GDP has declined to the level of GDP for the first time in over 30 years. And at the very same point, consumer spending has shot upward dramatically. This is the, the effect of, of the ACA. And then what Summer said is we need to reform entitlements, right? This, this is the thing. Old people are extraneous to capitalism. And if you give them pensions, if, if you give them, these are essentially workers who no longer are producing for capitalism. And if you give a pension and medical care, it sets a bad signal, essentially, to the rest of the population. You know, if, if you can have a secure retirement, why can't we have free higher education? Why can't we have uh, housing as a right? It was great of her to say that. Why can't we, we have single payer? Why can't? Of course we can have all these things. We're far richer than we were in the 1950s and 60s, and yet it's, it's gone backwards. So it's, it's very important to not have any illusions about the role that the Democratic Party plays, because I think trying to actually forge a, a progressive uh, 
force within it is going to be extremely difficult. And there's a lot of enemies within the Democratic Party to any sort of socially progressive policy. Thank you. Yeah, I know we're, we're going to have to uh, wrap it up. And in just uh, listening, I, I, I must say I was encouraged with the, um, the outline that was given on various progress made um, in the California legislature. But just in terms of some marching orders, I, I think one of the things we really have to do is to figure out a way to get the people and the faces who are not in this room, in this room, and to the table and give some access to them. We can analyze, we've got a lot of brilliant analysts, we could write, we could scream our heads off. But if we don't know, you know, uh, the, the, the filmmaker who did Tales of the Grim Sleeper in the Los Angeles Times two days ago when they had the article about it, He's a British filmmaker and he said, Los Angeles reminds me of Johannesburg. It's apartheid. Think about it. What do we know about each other's communities? You know, people aren't stupid. You know, a lot of people think, well, you know, people of color, you know, they vote for Obama or whatever. They don't know what the hell they're doing. People are very sophisticated politically about a lot of things. Their voices are not heard. We don't know about each other's lives, okay? We have to do the work of finding out and finding out what is it going to take for young black and brown faces to be in this room. You know, Native American people, there's some um, traditions that have a prayer to the four directions and there's one where they face the west and they say to the dark waters of looking within. We have to look within. It's all well and good to point elsewhere. This is where the problem is, and this is where the problem is. But we have to do that kind of work among ourselves. And we have to find out why is it that the white vote for the Republicans did increase in the midterm elections. The Democrats lost percentage points among Latinos. Republicans gained percentage points among Latinos. This is some of the reality that we're dealing with. Young people from East LA, trust me, they're trying to get themselves together from South LA in Florida. The whole Trayvon, Justice for Trayvon thing got sold out. In Ferguson, the young people are trying to hold on so the same thing didn't happen, but without you, we can't do it. We really can't do it. It'll continue business as usual, and people will get depressed. I have to believe, a lot of us in our communities, we have to believe that we will find our way through because our lives depend on it. We don't have any choice. You know, it's like Tupac said, you got to figure out how to make a, a dollar out of 50 cents. That's what we got to do day in and day out. And we need your help. We need each other. You know, I, I really don't know how much more to say than that. Race is a problem. We can't stop acting like it's not a problem. It's a problem. It's a problem within the Democratic Party. You know, quite liberal families are very shocked when some experiment is done with their little children and, and, and the children point to the darker person and say, that's the bad person. You know, I saw that when I was teaching young kids. This is the reality, okay? So I, I really don't know what more to say. I've made some suggestions about some practical bills and resources that um, can be supported to help our communities. So please look into them, please help in that way, but also don't turn a blind eye to the reality of what it means to devalue the lives of some of us and not of others in this country, including within this Democratic Party. 
give people some access, not to go sell out and sell out the community in search of the career, become an NGO and just search after the brand and forget about the movement, but to keep front and center, like King said, until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. We need each other. Thank you.